So um, tell me about how you became a gardener, a farmer. What do you consider yourself to be? Um, probably a gardener. A gardener, yeah. okay. Hopefully someday a farmer. Mm-hmm. Um, I wasn't very interesting, interested, I guess, in gardening um, when I was growing up. I grew up in a really big city in South America. Um, so we never really had any experience with plants or anything like that. It was really urban. Yes. What extremely. city was that? Uh, Bogota in oh, Colombia. Bogota, nice. mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, we had little programs in school where they would do like a little bit of gardening, um, try to grow some greens, but I wasn't interested at all. Um, but then um, after I moved here and I started my um, undergrad in, uh, here at Missouri State, um, I went to high school here and I, my boyfriend and I were living together at the time. Um, and then we started during, like, I think it was slightly before the pandemic, he was really into gardening because his father gardens a little okay. bit. And so he didn't know a lot. He didn't really know anything. He just wanted to start some. And so we got, I think, uh, some seeds and we started some pots and we got a strawberry plant and it was fun. Yeah. And then the next year with the pandemic, I think um, we just decided we were renting a house at the time and we decided to make a little patch of our front lawn into a garden. Um, I mean, it was probably like two feet by eight feet or something like that. It was tiny. It was yeah, but we put a bunch of plants in there, um, things that we had never, ever seen or heard of before, like tomatillos. I had never experienced okay. uh, tomatillos in my life. We grew some tomatoes. Um, it was a shaded spot, so mm-hmm. I'm surprised that we had any uh, success at all. But we grew cucumbers, and um, during like doing this, uh, Prior to that, I hadn't really had much experience test or trying new foods. Mm-hmm. I wasn't a very like diverse eater, um, so I didn't really consume a lot of um, veggies. But this forced me to because I didn't like to waste the food that we were growing. So I started making salads because we had lots of lettuce and cucumbers and tomatoes and stuff like that. Um, and then I just got really into it that summer. Um, at the same time. I was dealing with a diagnosis uh, in my health, and so I was just trying to look for ways to be healthier and sort of connect more um, with myself. And so it was really fun and something that me and my boyfriend at the time could do together. Um, And then he, um, so he went to do his undergrad at Mizzou. So I was kind of taking care of it and like, um, it was fun. But then um, that summer in 2020, I reached out to an old high school friend of ours who, um, whose sister was the campus garden manager at the time. Okay. And so I was like, hey, if you know of any jobs or any positions that were open, because during the pandemic, my hours at my other job were limited. They were like less than 10. Right. And so I was looking for another job anyways, and I was like, that sounds like a lot of fun. So she uh, told him to contact her, and so I contacted her she sent me the application because they were hiring at the time and I applied and uh, I got the job (laughs) I didn't have um, a ton of knowledge in gardening I didn't really know much I didn't have experience uh, other than like what happened at home but um, I did have knowledge with plants and house plants and succulents and stuff like that so I felt like I could do it and then I started that summer at the garden and I was in shock I just learned so much (laughs) every day um at the time the management wasn't necessarily super hands-on okay so uh, I just had to teach myself a lot of it wow and um just kind of learn on my own by making mistakes and just watching a lot of videos reading a lot of books um and then the next summer my manager um who is a dear friend of mine now um got an an internship at another um, job another position in farming and so I was like I can do it and um, so I didn't get the race to be a manager but mm-hmm. I managed the garden that summer and I had no idea what I was doing but I learned and I was like teaching myself how to start plants trying out new things that she hadn't tried before uh-huh. and her and I like we didn't communicate a lot cause she was really busy so I had two um workers that were working with me um and they weren't very interested in the garden they were they were not very interested in like pushing it forward and making it grow and you know like working a lot there so it was really hard work but i managed it that summer um it didn't fall to the ground it didn't <laughs> <laughs> uh it didn't look great but i did my best How and, big is it? um i'm not sure but it's pretty large um 
we have eight uh, bed raised beds that okay. are I think maybe four feet by like 20 feet or so okay and then we have some back beds uh, I don't remember how many maybe six beds that are about the same um, the same yeah the same size so we have a lot of land we have a lot of space yeah. uh, it's a lot to manage especially as somebody who doesn't know what she's doing <laughs> um, we had lots of pests and lots of yeah. issues I, What's your recommendation for grasshoppers? I'm overrun with grasshoppers. Um, right yes, now. I just hand pick and throw into soapy water. No, constantly. So I just like, well, you know, we at the garden last summer, we have grown a lot since yeah. I started. So my main goal was to just push. Yeah. So I became the manager last year. And last summer, we had actually so many volunteers that we didn't have things for them to do. So I just would tell them, pick grasshoppers. And so that's what they would do for two hours straight is just hunt grasshoppers. <laughs> so that's what, that's what I do. But at the time, I in that, that summer that I started sort of managing without really managing, mm -hmm. I just started spraying a bunch of neem and because yeah. that's what the internet says to do. And I could tell that things were just dying really quickly my squash, my cucumbers, powdery mildew, and mm. bugs everywhere, and it just wasn't working. And so I quickly thought, you know, this isn't working. This neem that I use in my house plants is not working. And then I started to get more, like, deeper and deeper into gardening, and I found out, you know, like, neem has other concerns with bees and mm -hmm. other animals that, you know, off-target effects. And I started taking more plants, my, my more plant-related classes and things like that because I'm a biology major. And then I quickly thought, you know, what if we just let the predators do the work for us? And so I basically last year, I took over the garden as manager last May. And you um, paid for it too. Yes, <laughs> I was. I, in that moment, I, yeah, I started. Um, and I basically redid the way that we think about gardening. I decided not to think of it as like a farming uh, where we just need to get the produce no matter what. Mm -hmm but more of like a, let's work with nature and see what happens. Uh, and so I decided not to spray with anything anymore because um, I previously had been spraying with um, BT and other organic things that are considered safe but that can have or off-target effects and can have problems. And so I just decided to do that and over the last year and a half I've noticed we have predators and we have we have very few problems with pests other than, you know, your squash, because the squash is just meant to die. Yes. <laughs> but other than that, I think um, it really has changed in that we are more, much more successful. Um, and we have to do less work. We have to do less spraying, because I was actually thinking um, just the other day, two years ago, three years ago when I started, I would do weekly sprays mm -hmm. where I would go to the garden and spray the entire thing up from top to bottom because I didn't know anything about bugs. I didn't know which ones were good and which ones were bad. I just thought bugs equals bad. And now I know I have this deep knowledge. I've taken entomology and I've no, I have this deep knowledge of what bugs are good, what are bad. I still learn a lot, but yeah. I do have a, in the back of my mind, like I see a bug and I'm like, are you a friend or a foe? And if you're a foe, I can just pick you and squish you. I don't need to spray. Right. And you might not be that big of a problem anyways. So um, we do have, I mean, actually I'm just in shock. Uh, I'm surprised at how many ladybugs we have. Uh, we have praying mantises. We have tons of like, um, hemipterans that are predators and just a bunch of bugs that are good yeah. and we also have a ton of birds that stop by so yes. I um, towards the end of my undergrad I became really interested in birds and mm -hmm. I did some research in birds and the bird that I focused on was a Carolina wren okay. and that's an insectivore and I've noticed uh, in the last few months when I go to the garden in the early mornings they're hopping around in the beds oh, cool. eating bugs here and there and so I just I it blows my mind at how these animals can do so much for us and they there's like this um feeling of balance and uh, yeah balance that just it works you know I, I heard a quote by somebody the other day that said um if some if if nothing in your garden is being eaten you are not part of the environment and you're not part of the ecosystem and so it, it really hits me like it's fine for a plant to be eaten you can have holes in your leaves and it not matter. You can still get a beautiful harvest. It's just 
about it not dying. <laughs> and so we very rarely intervene. And when we do intervene, it's because we just need a few more weeks for something to ripen, or we just need, you know, like just a little push. Um, like powdery mildew gets really bad out of the garden. Mm -hmm. So we might spray it very rarely with some neem to control the, the mildew, but not so much with the bugs. So, yeah. That's, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> and you developed that entire philosophy kind of on your own? Yeah, um, I would say probably not on my own. Uh, I do have, with, you know, it's interesting, people have problems with social media because they get into it, but I have curated, I think it was in 2020, I decided I would curate my social media for it to teach me. And so I basically, if you go through my Instagram account, it's just gardening. Um, and so I've learned a lot from people who have a lot of opinions and I just try everything or not everything, but try what they say, especially the people that I find credible and I learn a lot, and whatever works, I do again, or I bet I improve it. But um, yeah, I've just picked and choose and chose, I guess, uh, in between different people who post different things, and have learned my own techniques. That's really cool. Are there any books or I don't know social media, YouTube channels or whatever that have been? Yeah, helpful? definitely. Um, from YouTube, I started on YouTube. Um, there are, there's a person who's like M.I. Gardener who's in Michigan and teaches a bunch of things. Um, Epic Gardening is a wonderful resource. They have so much knowledge. Um, and then recently I've gotten really into flower growing, so I have a garden on my own and I'm hopeful that someday I'll have my own flower farm. So I follow um, Blossom and Branch, I think is her name. Um, she has a beautiful flower farm in Colorado and she uses regenerative gardening which means no pesticides no fertilizers just nature and she does an amazing job and i think it helps that she's in colorado because i think the pest pressure is not as strong as it is in the south but i do think that what she has to say is really still important i think i follow her also flower growing seems to be a really new kind of Everywhere I look, people yeah. are talking about flower farming. Yeah. What got you interested in that? Where you know, that I can't tell if it's more popular or, or if we're more involved in it, uh, you know, because, <laughs> but I, I, first when I started gardening, I talked to my old manager about this and we laughed because I was like, why do we go grow flowers? This is stupid. Why? Like, <laughs> it's, we could use this space for something that produces food. Um, and so at first I was confused and then um, we grew some zinnias. And they were so beautiful, mm -hmm. like so, so beautiful. And so I was like, okay, they're easy to grow and we'll grow them again. So the year that I was on, in charge, I just grew a bunch of zinnias everywhere I could and different types of flowers and it was so much fun. And then over time I figured I'll grow them at home. And so I grew some rows of zinnias and I had so many that I was like, you know, I could sell these. Yeah. And so I started selling little bouquets and uh, now I'm just obsessed. It just quickly escalated to me planning out a whole flower garden, having my own beds to sell bouquets and working with other people locally who are really interested in this too. And so it's just a way for me to make some extra money on the side and also just I'm super passionate about it. I mean, I see flowers that you can never buy at a store. Yeah. You can grow a zinnia for so cheap and people will go crazy because it's beautiful and beautiful. it's new. and. And then also just the pollinators. I mean, mm -hmm. seeing the way that nature interacts with flowers, the butterflies, the bees, the different types of wasps, it's wonderful. I am obsess I like, I'm obsessed with the way that uh, plants interact with animals and just nature overall. And I love seeing insects on my flowers and I love seeing everything just work together. So um, yeah, that's how I got into it. That's amazing. So you didn't have sort of deep family roots in no, farming or gardening? Not at all. I don't, I don't think anybody uh, in my family has gardened. I know that m one of my grandfathers uh, in Colombia grew a mango tree and an avocado tree in the backyard, but I don't think it, he was passionate about it. I think it was more uh -huh. of like a, we get some food out of it. Where do you think your passion came from? I'm not really sure. Um, I've always been very nature-oriented. Um, compared to my family, it's actually really funny because my family lives in Texas now. Um, and when I go visit my brother 
he has this beautiful big house in this beautiful community and there is no nature anywhere it's in austin and then there is we call it a concrete oasis basically it's just it's a it's a desert there's no life anywhere wow. um and it's so sad to me because i see my nephews growing up in that in that and the you know they even have grass that you know they pay for to cut and to fertilize and then they cut it and they water it and whatever but that's the extent of it and so i try to you know sneak in little <laughs> bits of gardening into my nephews' lives they have them growing growing some radishes here and then and <laughs> they get excited but i think my passion is just from myself because my family is not passionate about nature or growing and things like that they don't like getting their hands dirty they don't like an uneven landscape i think my mom would be the one that would be closest to it um, but she still wouldn't be willing to put in the work that it takes to garden that's funny <laughs> yeah that's so interesting so it's really kind of all your own yeah it really is and that's it's what set, what really sets me aside and or apart is you know uh, they they are very different in that sense they came to Springfield for my wedding this summer. And I was like, the main thing that I wanted for them to see is the garden. Right. Like, let me show you the garden. Let me show you what I've done, what I've accomplished, because I'm so proud of the work that we've done. And the team that I've built, mm -hmm. who are people who are also just so passionate about gardening, because um, I, I handpicked my own team and I'm so proud of them and how they've grown. And so, you know, and I show it to them and I can see that they're like, proud of the work and they're like but they have no idea what it is yeah. like and they have no idea the passion that goes into it and i i can just tell right away that it we we can't share that they so they don't feel the same no they don't <laughs> <laughs> maybe they can listen to this interview afterwards yeah maybe <laughs> you, you know i i know that they are proud of the work and i know that like they like the way that it looks and you know they but it's just I don't know. It's just something that you can't describe. It's yeah. a it's a passion. Yeah. So, tell me a little bit more about your garden. So it's you said eight four by twenty beds. Yeah, something like that. Something I don't like remember. that. And where is it located? Um, so it's um located just uh south of campus. It's on nine thirty East Normal Street. Um, and it's just across the street from Kemper Hall, basically. Okay. Um, be, behind the parking lots and your hand-picked team yeah that where did you get them from where did you find them um so when I first started last May or I guess the May before last I um I got to hire an entire team because I was the only one who was staying okay. the two girls that were working with me beforehand didn't want to work anymore and I didn't really we didn't get along very well because they weren't very passionate so I just said, you know, let's just start from scratch. And so I took over as manager, and I was very nervous. I had imposter syndrome, for sure. I just thought, I, I don't know if I can do this. But I put out um, a lot of information about the garden, and I started putting out flyers, like, we're hiring, we're hiring. My first step was to think of volunteers in the past and who, who was highlighted and who was um, really good. And I immediately thought, you know, there's this one guy who comes – always to the garden and who's always really um, interested in what we have to say and what I do and who seems to know even more about me about, or about the gardening than I do um, and he does indeed knows a lot he knows a lot more and so I was like I reached out to him through Instagram and I was like hey would you like to work for the garden and immediately he was like yes and um, I think you you guys already interviewed him his name's Alejandro oh okay. yeah and so right away I was just like He's a for sure. I know that he needs to work for the garden. Um, and then the rest, we got a bunch of applications and we interviewed all of them. Um, I was looking for people who were passionate and who were willing to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and people who didn't shy away from working in groups, who wanted to communicate well, who like were willing to create a little bit of a family. Um, and so I found um, one of our employees, Claire, who was very young at the time, very um, just shy and sweet, and I knew that she had a lot to learn. She's a plant science ma major, and I knew that she would be she would be a great addition to the team because I felt like we could grow together. Mm -hmm. um, and then I talked to my professors too. I was like, if you know anybody who's like great. One of my professors quickly said, I have the, I have the girl for you. I know who it is. It's, her name is Alexis. 
And so um, the day that applications were closing, I emailed her and I was, or she told her and she applied right away. She sent me the application within the hour. And I was like, this is great. She seems great. So um, she's, you know, she had been in the army and she has a five-year-old and she has these experiences and she seems like she's hardworking and she's fantastic. And now she's my best friend. Um, and then I think uh, I had another friend who we hired for social media because I knew that she could be a good addition. And that's where we started. Um, Alexis graduated and is doing her master's now so she couldn't work at the garden anymore. So she only did one, uh, one summer and one semester at the garden. But she's still very interested in what we do and everything. And like I said, I'm very close friends with her. And then we hired um, some more people this year. Um, we hired a girl from, um, she, her name is Mansa, and uh, I don't remember where she's from off the top of my head, but it's in the back of my, my brain. But she is fantastic, and she is just new here. She just moved to America in January, so okay. she's very new. She's super young. She's only 18, um, and she's just loving it. She learns so much. She asks questions and she's very interested in everything that we do. And she's a computer science major, so she's not, you know, like uh, plant related, but I knew right away from the moment in her interview that she would be a great addition. And she is, she's fantastic. And then we also hired a new um, social media manager and she's super willing to come out and help at the garden, which is great. Her name's Shelby, she's also 18. We wanted young people who would stick yeah. around for a few years, and um, yeah, so I've, I've gotten to just sort of see who is passionate, who is willing to work hard, because it's very hard work, and who's willing to communicate well, and kind of um, become friends with each other, and so now I, um, I'm starting my master's next week, so I had to let go of the garden, which made me very, very sad. Um, so it's only undergraduate students run? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. And so I, uh, I appointed Alejandro as the manager, and I just I know that he's going to do amazing, amazing things with the garden. He only has one year, but he's going to be great, and I am so proud of everybody who um, I've picked, and I'm so excited to see what they do, and also very, very sad to be leaving, but um, yeah. Where are you doing your master's? Here in Missouri You're State, also. yeah. Mm -hmm. So are you going to stop by and visit the garden? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I told them when I left, uh, my last day was Sunday, and I told them, you know, I'm going to try my hardest not to come for two weeks, but I don't know if I can do it. <laughs> and so I told them, like, I'm going to try to come every two weeks or so because I don't want to overstep. I don't want to take over. Hey, your, yeah, yeah. yeah. I want him to have his creative <laughs> freedom, and I want him to have that feeling that I did of like doing his own thing, but I also just can't stay away. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's your baby. Yes. <laughs> How did you choose what you grow there? Um, so at first it was, you know, like what my manager wanted to grow. It was very, um, it was interesting because their choices were different, were very different from what I would do um, now that I have information. She wanted to produce a lot of the same and a lot of safe crops like that would be easier to grow and some things that looked really good but weren't best sellers like chard, Swiss chard is something that you can grow really easy and it's beautiful to grow but people hate it. They don't want to eat it. And so we would donate it and it would just go to waste really? right away because people don't want to eat it. <laughs> and I think maybe if we tried it now again it might work but um, we... Um, now the, my 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 way to do it is things that bring us excitement. Mm -hmm. um, we try different types of tomatoes, that varieties that look fun, that look exciting, that have a good record of being tasty and easier. Um, but we don't shy away from a challenge. We grow things that are difficult, like squashes, and um, we just go through like an entire plan on what we're gonna do and how we're gonna keep it alive for as long <laughs> as possible. And we do it. Um, this year, that included netting. And we did that for the first, uh, until the plants were too big and we're pushing the netting up. Mm -hmm. um, but it worked. It, 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 they did great. They, uh, they're still alive, oh, wow. <laughs> which is great. Um, we grow, I mean, this year, I was so excited to grow winter squash because we haven't done that before. And so we have a ton of butternut oh, wow. that's coming up. And I'm so excited about that harvest. One of the things that I'm most passionate about is growing sweet potatoes. 
Um, cause I was the first one to introduce the idea of sweet potatoes. They had never been grown before that I know of, and they're so easy to grow. They're a superfood. They're extremely nutritious. They're tasty. You can cook them in a million ways. And all that you require is really is you plant them and you water them. That's it. You don't have to do anything. They don't have any pests. They, they're great. And I'm super excited. I told Alejandro, if you don't tell me when you're going to harvest those sweet potatoes, I'm going to complain. <laughs> like, I need to be here. Are they like the traditional yeah. orange sweet mm-hmm. potatoes? Yeah. We, uh, we've experimented with different varieties and found that the best one that I can see that does best here in Springfield is Centennial. And so that's the kind that we grow. Um, this year we did an entire bed of just Centennial. And I think we're going to get maybe 100 pounds of sweet potatoes because last year we only got I think it was like a maybe a third of the sweet potato plants that we put in actually produce good sweet potatoes because we I only put like about a third of centennials and we got like 60 something 70 pounds so I think this year we can break 100 wow yeah where does the food go that you everything we grow um goes to the bear pantry so um, a little bit of that is now um, going to um, what we have is community memberships. And so that helps us fund our um, adventures and our uh, trials and errors and everything. Um, and so we've been donating, since starting last week, we've been donating about 15 to 20 pounds, or not donating, selling 15 to 20 pounds to people of, who are in the community who want to. So like CSA boxes? Yes, yes. Very cool. We call it CGM, but yeah. Okay, what's the CGM? Uh, Campus Garden Membership. Campus Garden yeah. Membership. Very cool. How much does it cost to be a community member? Um, so this year we did a month for $30. So it comes off to being like $1.5 uh, per pound, which isn't too bad for organic, uh, local, locally grown produce. So yeah. That's and not bad at all. we only have a few spots open, so we only did five people um, because we want to still donate the most, the majority of our produce to the bear pantry. That's our goal is to help with food insecurity. That's really cool. Is food insecurity something that you are interested in or is the gardening what you're interested in um, and the bear pantry is... That's an interesting question. I've thought about that because in the future I'd want to have my own, you know, big garden like this. Um, And I've thought about what would I do with that produce? What would my goal be? And I think food security is important to me. um, But I do think I'm most passionate about the gardening. I do love seeing, um, because as an international student myself, I know the trials and the um, discomfort that you can find in being here and having so many roadblocks and so many barriers um, to making money and to being self-sufficient. So I do love seeing our international students taking advantage of the produce that we grow, especially because I know um, that in other countries there's this feeling of not wasting your food, of using vegetables and eating your vegetables and they're more willing to be adventurous and to um, cook the produce that we donate in different ways. Um, so I'm very happy with them taking that produce home, and I know that it's going into the right hands. But I'm also very excited when I see um, you know, an American student who might not be as food insecure as an international student, but is still wanting some extra help and is um, trying new foods because of what is available. So, you know, when something is free, you're more willing to take it than if you have to pay for it. You know, like a kid, an 18-year-old kid might not go to Walmart and buy a butternut squash, but if they see it for free at the bear pantry, they might be willing to grab it and cook it and see what happens. And so helping in that aspect of, like, uh, food variety or diversity and health is also very important. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what the answer to my question is. I think I would probably donate some of my food and then sell some other to, you know, be self-sufficient in the future. Um, but I do still think that helping the community, um, if, if only for the experience of consuming new foods and of uh, taking care of your body, I think that would be enough. Yeah. So your own kind of journey from being a very limited eater. <laughs> yes, exactly. Trying more new things because you were growing yes, up. Is yes, yes. 100%. I, I mean, I, I can't wait. Nowadays, I, I can't wait for tomato season. And I never ate a tomato in my life before. Wow. It had to be cooked and it had to be in a sauce and it had to be hidden. I mean, I would never ever eat an onion if I saw it. 
I mean, my, my, my brother is still like that way. He's, he can't eat something if, he, if there's an onion in it. Really? Yeah. Um, I never really ate any peppers because we don't eat peppers really in Colombia very much. Um, I, I didn't have a very, very, like a very healthy diet. It was mostly just like meat and carbs. And right. so I had never really, um, in South America, broccoli is not very common. Mm-hmm. It's not very popular. And I still have issues with some veggies. Like I cauliflower, I'm not so sure about. It seems kind of gross. Um, you just have to roast it. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Much <laughs> um, and zucchini I'm starting to get on board with. I yeah. still struggle a little bit with it, but... I do, I mean, I do go to some, to some restaurants sometimes and think, oh, these veggies are amazing. So yeah. good. And so when I grow them at home and I get that flavor, I'm like, I'm obsessed with this. This right. is so good. Like, I, one of the things that I love growing is garlic because you just can't get anything like it anywhere else. It's so fresh and so strong. So we grow, my husband and I, we grow like 120 cloves of garlic every wow. fall. And we harvest them all and we give them away to friends. We show them how good it is to taste the garlic, to cook with it. Um, Because I'm also very passionate about cooking. And so growing veggies also like allows me to go out to my garden and pick things and just make something on the spot, which is so beautiful. Um, But yeah, I think uh, garlic is one of my favorites because it's so easy and it's just so fun I yeah. every July or every June when it's ready to pick I'm excited to process it I make braids you know it's so fun that's super that's super neat I was gonna ask you how you feel about your crops but you've already told me yeah, I love them all the different ones that you love do you do any native crops or any specialty crops anything like that um I don't think so I don't think we do anything like extra fancy I think right now we're just Um, We have only six beds at my house, and so we just try to grow what we know we're going to eat. Right. And right now I'm growing two eggplants, which I don't know how I'm going to eat those because I don't like eggplants, (laughs) but I'm going to cook them into something and eat them. (laughs) We have three already grown eggplants, and they're sitting in my fridge looking at me like, are you ready? (laughs) Do you have any plans for them? I'm probably going to cook them into some sort of pasta so that they're not very obvious. (laughs) Um, so what you were doing the gardening as a job for a while Mm -hmm. right and what keeps you going with gardening now you're not getting paid to do it anymore you know I would do the job without getting paid easily I would take over in a heartbeat if I could um I kept telling my coworker Alejandro, it is a dream that I get to do this for money. Like, I would constantly be in awe of the fact that I would be getting paid a good wage to do what I would want to do for fun, to do what I would go home to do again. Like, it is mind blowing to me that I was given this opportunity and I'm so thankful for it. Um, but it's just a dream. I can't describe it as anything other than that. I think I've peaked and that was like my my top job and I think from that point forward I'm not sure what I'm gonna do (laughs) yeah (laughs) because I'd want I'd go back in a heartbeat I'd do that forever if I could um work at a community garden and just get paid to do that I think I would do that every year happily and grow old doing it (laughs) I think that is a possibility (laughs) yeah would you want to continue that here in the Springfield area is being in the Ozarks is that something meaningful to you um you know I haven't I mean I've been here for almost a decade now and I do love the Ozarks I think they're fun and there's a lot of unpredictability Mm -hmm. that comes with it um I do wish we had better soil that's one of the things that uh, I struggled with here you don't like rocks I don't (laughs) I'm not a geologist I I when I dig and I find that four inches down in the ground I find a big rock I'm very frustrated and I feel like um, Illinois sounds nice, <laughs> which is funny because my coworker Alejandro is from Illinois, so oh, he knows he's experienced that loamy soil, and um, we struggle so much at the garden with that. But I think that if I were to say, it would have to be raised beds and uh, you know better soil. But I'm not sure. I think Illinois sounds great. Sounds great. <laughs> yeah. Is that because of Alejandro's of the soil? Yeah. Well, the no. Soil. Actually, I said it before I met him. I just. I know that um, the 
their, you know, the glacial melting yeah. gave really loamy and rich, nutrient-rich soil, and that just sounds wonderful to just till up a whole bed and grow in the soil. That sounds it's great. Like a giant bed. It's yeah. Like, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I see good soil, and I touch it, and I grab it, and I'm like, this is fantastic. I mean, you know, it's. Bl- I I tell people it's gold. That's gold. I mean, we yeah. had this delivery earlier this year of uh, compost, and it's black. It's loamy it's beautiful and people i mean volunteers are like kind of weirded out by how passionate i am about the soil and i'm like it's beautiful look at it how can you not love it how excited you are about the compost (laughs) yeah all right um tell me about some challenges that you've had since you started this whole gardening journey anything related to finances to knowledge to i don't know your own background Mm -hmm. um I think um, the biggest challenge is definitely money um, in my own personal garden. Uh, the campus garden, we have a pretty good budget. It's, it's beautiful, so we are able to have a lot of freedom, and we were able to grow a lot in terms of like what we wanted to do. It was very, um, it was a dream, really. I had an unlimited, basically, you know, obviously responsible, but unlimited right. budget to what I could do. About how much did you spend a year? For- um, not very much to begin with. I don't remember, I, I never really got the number to begin with because I thought we didn't have very much money available. Um, that's That was my experience. And then I quickly realized, I was told, you know, you have a lot of money left. And so you have to use it, otherwise you lose it. And so then I started thinking, you know, we actually have quite a bit of money. Um, I think including wages and um, materials, we have almost about $35,000 a year, um, which is a lot of money. A lot of money for good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, some of it, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a, an amount of money that sticks around that every year is the same. Um, and then some money is replenished for wages. But, um, yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, we, we were able to... Uh, go whatever we wanted right. and and, um, and that's why it was important to me to have a good team because it's important to have somebody who's responsible and who knows what our mission is what we because my first thought when I first took over as manager was let's define a mission okay. let's define what we want to do why we're doing this it's not just to grow it um, and it's not just for people to take it home and waste it no, it's, it's, it's for something, and I want to know why. I okay. want to know why we want to do this. I want to be able to hire people and tell them why we do this. And our mission statement is serve, educate, grow. And so I started digging into that. Like, what does that mean to me? What does that mean to the university? Serve, um, we, pro- you know, we provide opportunities for volunteers. And at first I wasn't so sure about the volunteer aspect, but then I really I started you know, getting out there and sharing about the garden constantly. And then I realized, you know, people are learning a lot from being here, from coming here. People would come dragging their feet because they had to do it for a class or they had to do it for, you know, uh, service learning or uh, fraternity, sorority. And then they would like drag their feet around and be like, I don't know about this. Then they would leave and be like, I'm definitely coming back. This was fun, this was great. And I always tell people like, it's therapeutic. You know, Mm -hmm. you're out. For once in your life, you are out forcing yourself to be outdoors without your phones, with dirty hands, without, you know, access to TV or whatever. And you're just being, you're thinking, you're processing nature, you're touching it with your hands. It's wonderful. And so people would feel kind of free. And so I think that's um, allowing for opportunities for people to serve and do something for um, greater good or for another reason other than themselves is really important. I'm very passionate about volunteerism. I've done, um, in high school, I did about 100 hours of volunteer work at the Humane Society. And so I'm very passionate about doing something that's not for yourself or for, um, you know, your own, for a benefit. Yeah. It's just because you want to do it. It's because it's good. <clears throat> and uh, so that was the first part. And then our middle part is educate. Um, and I've learned that teaching people how they can, how easily they can grow something, even if they're in a dorm, you can grow arugula, you can grow lettuce, you can grow microgreens. Um, just having people learn is so exciting because most people haven't, I mean, a lot of people haven't seen a plant growing uh, produce before. And I mean, I, I know, personally know a lot of people who had never seen a pepper plant 
I had never seen a pepper plant before I started. I had never seen a tomato plant. I had never seen anything grow other than cilantro, I think. Um, and so it was mind blowing to me to think of the different ways in, th in which things grow. And it's so exciting to learn about nature and how it can help you and how can, you can be self-sufficient. And I think giving people that power to grow your own food, to have that freedom of, um, you know, you're, you're not dependent on somebody else to prov provide you with food and you're not dependent on going to the grocery store. I mean, to an, to an extent you are, you know, yeah. obviously. Um, most people are, and I am. But to an extent, I'm also, I also know that I have some freedom, that I have some of that power to me because I can grow some of my food. And I love that. So that's, that's very important. And then grow is part of our mission statement, and I think that's where I, it really shines um, in the sense of we not only grow socially be, be within, within the community, we, you know, we get so many people who stop by and learn so much, again, the education, and, um, but also we want to provide food for people. Um, whether they desperately need it or not is not really what's so important to me. What's important is to give them the opportunity to, yeah. to have access to it. Um, because while we, while some students here in Missouri State do experience food insecurity, and I wish that wasn't the case, I know that um, we're not experiencing the same food insecurity that is common in other countries. Right. And I have the perspective of coming in of like knowing what what really bad food insecurity is like. And so I, while I know that some of these people might be willing to go to the grocery store and get some chips for a dollar or whatever, I'm still able to kind of force them in a way to, mm -hmm. to consume these different foods and like me, grow in that aspect and be healthier. And I do think that if we had a better diet, we wouldn't have so many health issues mm -hmm. and uh, mental health issues and stuff like that. So I've talked about this um, recently because we did like an interview process at the garden for a video. And um, I started talking about mental health, and I truly am so impressed and so passionate about how gardening can help with mental health. Right. And I think that if all of our students came out and enjoyed some time out at the garden, it would be so extremely beneficial. I mean, I can see it in people's faces how freeing it is to just work with your hands, even if it is weeding, which is not fun yeah. but you do it and you spend an hour or two just pulling weeds you are connecting with yourself you're being forced to just have your own thoughts to not be distracted to not be communicating with others necessarily sometimes we have great conversations mm -hmm. and that's wonderful because we make friendships and we make uh, connections but sometimes it's just silence and hearing the birds hearing like even the traffic just listening like taking a moment to be present can be so beneficial for people. You're saying that in your own personal garden, finances are definitely right. a little bit of a problem. <clears throat> yeah, uh, they are. Um, you know, the, to begin with, soil is so expensive. Compost is so expensive. Um, I mean, like, the only thing that's not expensive is the seeds. Right. And <laughs> so I wish, I wish that was the only thing we needed. I wish, um, especially here in Missouri, that's a challenge because we can't just till up a bed and grow in the ground. Right. It, it, the, the, it wouldn't be that good. Um, so we, my husband and I, we found some you know raised beds that were uh, really cheap on Amazon. Mm -hmm. They were like $60, and we set up six of them over the years. And we filled them up as, like, slowly, and we fill them up as we can. We spend $100 here and there on soil and compost and things like that. And... Um, we're, we're, every year we improve and we do definitely spend quite a bit of money on the garden but yeah. it is you know I think about it and, I, and sometimes I feel a little guilty because it's so much money but to compared to our uh, budget and our income it is a lot of money but it's a way in which we connect mm -hmm. um, it's something that we share something that uh, improves our relationship that we feel very passionate about both of us and that allows us to have something else to do outside it gives us, um, you know, that freedom that I was talking about of, like, growing some of our food. It gives us excitement. Yeah. I mean, we look forward to it. We look forward to the spring and the summer. And um, I personally am a person who loves the winter time. Mm -hmm. I love the winter. Um, some people don't, and so they struggle with it. I think it's great. It's a break. 
And so when we talk about gardening with my husband, he's always like, oh, maybe we can move to California and we could grow food all year round. And I'm like, what's, what's the fun in that? We would have no break. We would have no excitement. It would just be always growing potatoes, always growing something. Right. And I think it's so much fun to have that break, to, to plan out your garden, to think about what you want to do, to let, let nature rest for a little bit, and then start strong in the spring and just not get burnt out. Because in late fall, when all of your plants are dying and you don't know what to do because there's so many bugs and yeah. mildew everywhere, you're kind of <laughs> sick of it. You're like, I kind of need a break. I can't water anymore. I'm sick of it. You know, because some summers, last summer, we didn't get any rain. Yeah. And so watering was a hassle, and especially with jobs, we couldn't really get it done at home. This year, it's been great because the rain has been taking care of it. But it varies every year. And I think there's beauty in that. I think there's so much yeah. beauty in not knowing what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so the winter gives you time to, like, dream. And oh, 100%. Look through seed catalogs. Yeah. And <laughs> yes. And then just, just uh, Christmas time, I just buy seeds. I ask for seeds, you know. For Christmas. <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. And my mom is... I, my birthday was last week, and my mom was like, what do you want for your birthday? And I was like, seeds. <laughs> like, <laughs> what did you get? What seeds did you get for your birthday? Um, a bunch of uh, flowers for my flower. More zinnias, <laughs> yeah. or have you um, branched out? Yeah, I got some different zinnias, some, some cleany zinnias that are so beautiful. And, but I did branch out a lot this year. I learned a lot. Um, for my wedding, I was originally hoping to grow my own flowers. Right. But I was very naive in thinking I could do that in June. Um, so that didn't work out. But I was able to reach out to Springfield Community Gardens, who helped me and donate a bunch of flowers to my uh, wedding. Really? Yes. And so I went to their um, the market garden. And the girl who works there, her name um, is Kay- Caitlin. She was like, you know, you can pick anything you want. And so she was showing me around. And she had this beautiful area of celosia and of asters that were like spaghetti and beautiful and she had this like you know just different types of things that I was like I've never seen these flowers in my life before and so she she gifted us like I think it was like eight or ten buckets of flowers which I mean I remember the morning of my wedding or the morning before my wedding I was driving home with the uh, you know a car full of flowers and I was thinking this is like a thousand dollars or more that's amazing and I got these for free and then I also reached out to a local flower farm Flora and Forge Mm -hmm. and I bought a bucket of flowers from her that was more specific to what I wanted you know some beautiful snapdragons and other just beautiful random stuff that she grew. She even gave us a bunch of um, bolting or uh, cilantro. And uh-huh. so it was really funny because while we were making bouquets, we were like, what smells like cilantro? <laughs> and then I quickly realized, oh, it's the flowers. <laughs> um, but it's, it was great anyways. And then, oh, um, so some that bolting ex- cilantro yes. in the garden right now. Yeah, there you go, you can use it. Um, but I quickly realized this year that there's so much variety and I can try yeah. so many different things. And I can work with nature too. So a lot of perennial flowers and a lot of uh, things that uh, grow naturally, I can, you know, you can use basil and it's beautiful in bouquets and, you know, yeah. it's tasty and it's great to grow. Um, I love, I would love growing mint, one of my favorites. Uh, I mean, seeing the pollinators with it is yes. fantastic and it looks lovely in bouquets. So I'm kind of in that idea of like edible equals great for the garden and for flowers too. I have a enormous mint patch that was mint that my mother gave me mm-hmm. and I planted it in my garden. <laughs> it takes over. <laughs> it's a mistake, but I love it because all the pollen yes. come and they just it's just alive with all of them buzzing it. It's it does beautiful. become a life. It's crazy. I mean, <laughs> we at the garden, it's so funny because volunteers come out and see it bl- in bloom and they're like, Oh no, the bugs, you know, there's so many bugs, so many wasps, because wasps <laughs> love mint. Yeah. And then that, I say, that's why we love it. That's why it's great. Exactly. You know, wasps are fantastic for a garden. And I, I think that's one of the things that I am very passionate about as well is showing people that nature doesn't have to be scary. Right. You know, a lot of people are very, very afraid of bees and wasps. And I'm like, I've never been stung by a wasp. Mm-hmm. And I work at a garden every single day. And I am. I have my own garden at home, and I have never been stung. And if you are stung, it's okay, yeah. you know. But the thing is, I've learned in my classes, these animals, they don't want to spend the energy that it takes to hurt you. Exactly. It takes up so much energy. It's months of work to sting you. 
I mean, why would they want to do this? They're not out to get you. Yeah. They just want their, their, you know, their nectar or their pollen or whatever, their bugs. <laughs> they feel threatened. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they just want to do their thing. And if you encroach, they, if, you know, if you, if you hurt them, they're going to hurt you. <laughs> yeah. Um, have you had any challenges relating to being Hispanic here in the Missouri, in the Ozarks region? Um, Necessarily Hispanic, I don't think so. I have been very, very welcomed yeah. um, to begin with. I started, um, I moved here in 2015, um, and I started, I entered high school at Parkview, okay. and it was a very welcoming school. Um, overall, it's a very diverse school and very willing. Um, there's a lot of diversity in income and um, race and everything, so it's it's a pretty wonderful school. It's, and the academics are not great, <laughs> I will say that, um, but the environment overall was pretty great. And then starting at Missouri State, it was, I mean, I feel like everybody's welcomed. I've never, I've never felt dis like discriminated against because of my race or because of who I am. And I feel like people in fact celebrated a lot more than I do. Um, <laughs> and I think people, you know, when I first started, people were like, oh, tell me more. And, and still to this day, when I tell people, I'm an international student. Um, people are like, I can't believe it. That's great. You know, tell me more about it. They're more excited about it than I am, for That's sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, I I've had issues with being an international student overall. Yeah. It's very difficult. Um, being here in this country legally is very difficult and very expensive. Um, and that's one of the qualms that I have with the government. I think is that. If I became legal, my life would probably be easier <laughs> than yeah. it is now, which is unfortunate. Um, but I mean, I even, you know, I'm married now, but I still, I can't afford the process to get a green card. So right. I still, and I've lived here for eight years, but I'm still not considered a resident in any way. I can't access a lot of scholarships. I can't access a lot of opportunities because of that. Right. And that, that can be very difficult. It can be very frustrating. Um, to be told no mm -hmm. so many times over the years and basically I've had a lot of professors who reach out to me and they're like you know you would be great for this and I immediately tell them I probably can't do that and they're like why and I'm like look into the fine print and let me know and every time they come back and they're like no you can't do it and I know that because I just expect it like That's I so know starting from scratch that I know that I can't uh, do a lot of things and it's very frustrating, and it's also very frustrating um, the fact that I can't work outside of campus mm -hmm. because it's very limiting. I don't have um, financial support from my parents. Right. My dad supported me for the beginning, but then he left, and so it's been very challenging to push through because I can only work 20 hours a week, okay. and it has to be on campus. I can't work anywhere else. And so during the summer, I can work more hours, but I still have a thousand hour cap every year. And like anybody else in Missouri State does. And so it's very limiting because I don't, like now that I'm starting my TA ship at the university, I only will get paid a thousand dollars a month at the end of every month. And I only get paid for some of those months. So from now until the end of September, I won't get getting paid anything. So I have to make do with you know my husband's income and so uh, the thousand dollars a month doesn't cover your expenses very well no. it's very little money and they expect that to be enough because i can't work on campus because i have a ta ship right. and i can't work outside of campus because of my legal status um so it's very frustrating <laughs> to be in that in that situation and you can't take on additional work on campus no i can't um because that would be against my ta ship mm -hmm. so um you know, pet sitting helps a little, but I still can't make an, like enough because then it would be considered income and that's illegal. Right. And so it's a lot of, uh, it's just, it's very frustrating because I don't know, I, it's interesting because I, I, I was talking to somebody in an international department and international students department and they were like, you need to provide a statement of financial support. And I was like, why? I have a TA ship. They, they're covering my tuition and, you know, they're giving me a stipend. She was like, well, because by per law, you, you will not be making enough money to be self-sufficient. Right. And I was like, but you expect me to be self-sufficient. She was like, no, we need somebody to provide $17,000 worth every year. And I was like, so I need somebody to provide a paper that says they will be providing $17,000 a year 
but they're not going to be providing that money. It's just so that they say that they would. And that's what happened. So I had my, uh, my mom's husband, my, my stepfather, um, sign a paper. But that doesn't mean that he's financially supporting no. me. <laughs> it just means that he signed the paper. And so it's kind of crazy to me that the state knows, you know, the government knows that we don't make enough money, uh, but we still need to provide financial support in some way. That's wild. Yeah. Um, and it's not just that. Just overall, like, being here for so long and becoming part of the culture, um, you know, like, I feel... I feel very proud to be here. I love this country, and I feel like I love it more than a lot of Americans do. Sure. Um, you know, because it's a lot about perspective. You know, you come from another country and a background that shows you what life can be like in in poverty or in distress. Yeah. And you come here and you see this beautiful place with peace and with freedom. And you know, it's flaws. It has flaws, like any other country would, but it's beautiful. It's safe. I feel so safe here compared to how I felt in Colombia. And, you know, like I've had these epiphany moments throughout the years where I'm like driving home or walking home and I look around and I'm like, I feel safe and I'm alone. It's like a movie. I mean, it's like I feel like I'm in, you know, a, a drama or a TV show or whatever. And I look around and I see these beautiful trees and houses and nobody has like fences with chicken wire on top or electric wiring and you know like broken glass or whatever and it's so beautiful and I know that big cities are dangerous but still not as dangerous compared to other countries right. and it's just like you, you can go to a big city and walk around with your phone out you could never do that in Colombia I mean that's extremely dangerous I can wear my wedding ring proudly and not hide it and not be afraid and it's beautiful. Exactly. Yeah, yes. I mean, my mom has so many experiences in Colombia of like uh, being mugged and threatened and horrible things that have happened. And I just, I'm very proud to be here, but it's really sad because they don't allow me to be very proud to be here. Yeah. And so I can't vote. I don't have a voice. I don't have, you know, like any choice over anything. Is there a path that to? There is, um, but it requires money. Right. And so, like, I'm married now, which uh, makes me eligible for applying for a green card. But it takes about 2000 to $3,000 to do that. And I'd have to do it again in a few years. Mm -hmm. And I just don't have that kind of money to do it right, right. now. So I just have to wait. No, that's really, that is really hard. I know international students are really stuck it's in some huge struggle. difficult yeah. situations. Yeah, situations that often make them vulnerable in mm -hmm. a lot of ways as well. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I mean, I think my mom over the years, she had to come also on a student visa and also do, I mean, I think she ended up doing like seven years of, of uh, school. She started at the English Language Institute and then she went to OTC mm -hmm. and she moved to Texas to a community college and did dental hygiene. She's a dentist in Colombia, okay. but she had to start from scratch here. Because of credentials. Yes, and which is fine. I understand. You know, her education is very different. She didn't have the pr the rigorous program that somebody here would have. But I do think that it should be easier to yeah. streamline that process. Um, if she is a good dentist, I think she should be able to become a dentist. But either way, she over the years became very frustrated and looked at me and she was like, "Why are we here? Mm -hmm. Like, and if we're here, if we want to be here, why are we here legally? I mean, we see." A lot of illegal people, which, you know, I understand their circumstances are very difficult, who get pardoned. And we're like, maybe that's the fastest way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe we should have done that, yeah. Feel like a sucker going through <laughs> Exactly, <that. laughs> yeah. I'm just getting scammed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's frustrating. That is really hard. But overall, the culture, I think, is very welcoming. And I haven't, I really haven't felt like my race in any way has... That's really affected you. Yeah. Um, what's your, what are you most proud of that you've done here in your gardening journey? Brag on yourself a little bit. When you were starting out, what was sort of like a yes kind of moment? I think I'm, I mean, I'm extremely proud of the garden. I'm extremely, of the campus garden, I'm extremely proud of how much it's grown. Mm -hmm. Not in terms of like how much land we have, but just how people are getting to know it and how it's affecting people and how um, it looks so beautiful. I mean, it's never looked like this before. I, I have heard from so many community members and so many staff and faculty on campus who just say, wow, 
it has never looked this good before. It's been open for almost 10 years and mm -hmm. never has looked this good. And so it, it just like warms my heart to see people who have enjoyed it for so long and have seen it grow and who tell me you are doing a great job. That you've made a difference. Yeah, I've made a difference. I've left a legacy and that it is my baby. I am so proud of it. I picked it up. I mean, I love, I love my dear friend, she was a, the manager beforehand, but it wasn't great. She was very busy and it, it looked terrible at times. It was very, I mean, I even had somebody come up to me during an event who said, you know, the garden looks terrible. And I was like, thank you. <laughs> We're doing our best. <laughs> but she, she was just like, it looks awful. And I was like, I know. <laughs> but now it's just, I mean, it's amazing. I want to come and see it. You should definitely go and it. see it. You can see it from across campus. And we have a shed now, which is great. We used to work with tools in the ground that we hid under plywood. Oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah. But I'm very proud of how it's affected people. I'm very proud of the team that mm -hmm. I've built over the years. I'm very proud of the people that have worked there and who have learned so much, have grown so much, have gone into leadership roles and... I've given countless presentations about the garden. I've given countless uh, speeches about it. And I just, I could brag about it forever. I could talk about it forever. What's been surprising in this whole journey? I mean, extremely surprising to me is the amount of money that we were given to <laughs> garden. Um, uh, mostly because it's, it's student funded. So students don't know this. Nobody knows this. But your fees go to places. And one of those places is the garden. So the students that pay for tuition are paying for the garden and therefore are able to benefit from the bear pantry. Um, and so the fact that we have these uh, resources and this support from the community to do what we do is just lovely. So I, it's really, it belongs to the students. It does, really. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. What do you wish you'd known when you started gardening? Oh, so much. I didn't know anything. <laughs> I didn't know anything. I wish I hadn't sprayed for so long. Yeah. Because um, we would have an even better community now. Um, and I wish I would have known how many people uh, could be impacted by the garden. I, I, I mean, I knew that I wanted to get the word out because my boss wanted to get the word out, but I wasn't sure that people were going to love it as much as they do. Right. And, like, last spring we had uh, an event out at the garden. Nobody came out because it was kind of rainy. So my coworker Claire, and I just loaded up our wagon, and we went around campus with tomato plants, and we gave them away to people. We just, I call it harassing people because <laughs> we just went around and... And gave away cards and brochures and plants, and people were so interested. I yeah. mean, very quickly, like, we had this, like, football player who was coming out of practice or whatever, and he looked kind of, you know, scary. And I was like, have you heard about the campus garden? And he was like, no, tell me about it. And I told him about it, and he was like, this is really cool. And I was like, this is crazy, you know, so many people who have never gardened before. Right. It just sounds interesting, and I think it's part of the culture nowadays to be more a little bit more nature oriented, mm -hmm. and the idea of gardening seems very like hip and fun. Um, right. People have never done it before, and I think just the idea of there being a garden is exciting for people. What advice would you give to somebody who's just starting out? Um, I do that a lot because we had some new stu new student workers come in. Um, my biggest I think for starters, one of my biggest pieces of advice was communicate well with your team. Okay. Um, learn and communicate and be willing, be willing to be honest with yourself and with others. Um, and I constantly told my team to be honest with me and with themselves. Like, if you feel like you have too much work on your plate, tell yourself, I have mm -hmm. too much work on my plate. And tell me, I can't do this. Um, and communicate with your team members. If you feel like somebody made a joke that was hurtful, um, just tell them. And more, most of the time they'll be like, I'm so sorry, I will never do that again. Yeah. And we can move on. Um, so it's not really garden related. But I think at the beginning we had a lot of issues with my old team because we weren't communicating well. Okay. And there was kind of a power struggle and we weren't sure who was doing what, especially because I wasn't really the manager, but I was managing 
And so it was like a lot of them not really wanting to do the work and me being really passionate about the work. And there was this mismatch in energy. Right. And so I think that my biggest priority when I hired the first team was I need people who are willing to communicate well. Yeah, And people sure. who want to work together. Um, but in terms of gardening, I think just have fun and try. Just have fun. Just try. <laughs> I think, you know, I have a lot of people who come up to me and they're, like, very worried about their plants not making it um, or not knowing how to take care of something. And it's just so simple. It really can be so simple. I mean... It becomes really complicated in, in the social media that you experience, or it becomes very complicated if you want it to be. Yeah. But it can be as simple as throwing some seeds on the ground and seeing what comes up. I mean, you can start. I told my mom because she has a new area where she wants to grow something, and I was like, grab some lettuce and sprinkle it on the ground, and you'll see it come up. Don't overthink it. Don't overthink it. I mean, it's so easy to get overwhelmed. And I did at first get so overwhelmed with deadlines for things, you know, because... You have, I mean, May is a fiasco. And, you know, like, it it is always a fiasco. No matter how hard you try, no matter how much you do, you can't ever get everything out right at the same time. Especially as students, we have our biggest course load is during the growing season. For sure. And so you'd really stress, and I, that's why I needed a good team, because I needed to be able to rely on other people. I quickly realized I can't go to Carl's and check on the greenhouse every day. I need somebody else to take care of this for me. So I got one of my team members, and I was like, I need you to focus on that because you have classes in Carl's, and it's easy for you to go upstairs. So she took care of it, and it took so much off my plate. That anxiety of like, oh, no, the plants might be dead. Um, You know, like work that you've done. You started in March. You started in February, really. We started our our brassicas or cauliflower and stuff like that um, in, in February. And then if you lose those plants, you've, like... In May, you've, it's months worth of work, yeah. <laughs> and so it's you need to be able to take care of that stuff. And I think, I mean, obviously we have the benefit of having a greenhouse, nice. but at home I don't have one, and so that's frustrating because starting things from seed is really difficult. Yeah. But I this year I, I was just like, screw it, let's just go to a greenhouse, a, a, a nursery, and buy plants. <laughs> And it's fine, you know, they're like a dollar a piece, if that. There's no garden police that comes. No, yeah. Yeah, and it's also just like, it can be very simple. You just grab a plant and plant it and see it grow. And um, my my brother-in-law, my my husband's brother, he started a little garden this year, and he was like really overdoing it. I mean, I told him, you know, prune your tomatoes. So he cut off every single leaf in his tomato plant. And I was like, that's not good. <laughs> um, so just let it be. And so then it's a mess. And yes. I was like, I, it's just about it being simple. You don't have to go crazy. And it doesn't have to go either way. Um, so I, I'd say my biggest piece of advice is start small. Uh, don't go crazy. And <laughs> just let the passion get to you. Let, let it come to you. Because if you go to it, you're going to get overwhelmed really quickly. So... I think, I think any gardener w- would agree that it's really hard not to go to nursery or to uh, plant stores during yeah. the growing season, and I think um, it's it's extremely difficult not to. I mean, it's it's almost impossible <laughs> to st- stay away from it. And when you go, if you feel that spark of joy when you see a plant, you know it can be like a tomatillo or a tomato that you've never grown before. Grab it and see what happens. You just never know. I love it. I am out of questions. Okay. Do you have any more things you'd like to add? Um, probably not. I don't think so. I've talked for forever, and I would probably talk for forever again. <laughs> it was so wonderful hearing all your stories. I really love that.